2 uh, Samuel chapter 7, we're just going to start reading. In the first couple verses, we're going to see that David has a desire to build a house for the Lord. Verse 1, And it came to pass, when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth was within curtains. Maybe... David is talking to Nathan, excuse me if I say Nathaniel, because I don't know why, but as I'm studying this out, I keep, even, I keep reading and even typing Nathaniel. It's Nathan. So if I, if I say Nathaniel, just, just give me some grace and know that I'm a, a knucklehead, but you'll understand what I'm trying to say. David is talking to Nathan, the prophet, and he's saying, how am I going to live in a house that's more sturdy, uh, built better, and really is more qualified to be a house? Uh, than where the ark of God uh, is dwelling. We know that in, in chapter 6, uh, David brought the ark back. We, we talked about that a little bit last week, how uh, it was on the cart and Uzzah reached forth his hand and God struck him. David said, how is the ark going to come to me? And he put it to the side. Uh, after three months or so, David gets his heart right. He brings it back into the nation. And of course, the ark representing uh, the presence of the Lord. So now the presence of the Lord and, and God's blessing is on the nation of Israel. In chapter 7, we see that God uh, has given David rest from all his enemies. And David's just kind of thinking now. Maybe for the first time in a long time, he's had some time to just sit and think not, where's my next meal coming from? Where is Saul going to try to attack me? Uh, where I'm at in my position here? Where are the Philistines going to try to attack us? Not wondering, when am I ever going to get my kingdom uh, fully set up here in the nation of Israel? And he just has some time to think. Maybe it was on a dark and stormy night, right? Maybe he, David is sitting on his porch and there's a, a thunder storm and there's rain and there's wind and David's sitting out looking from his house and thinking about how though he's protected from the elements, he's protected from the rain and the wind and the storm that's going on, thinking about the, the very fragile temple, the tent that the ark of God is being housed in and he's wondering, how is it that I am living in a, a house of wood and God is living in a house of curtains? And so David just begins to ask himself this question and he has a desire to build a house for God. Nathan agrees to the plan to build the temple, and he even says, hey, I think that's a good idea. I think you ought to do that. Verse 3, and Nathan said to the king, go do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. But this wasn't God's plan. Really, we'll see, Nathan spoke out of turn here. He said, that sounds great, that sounds like a good idea, but David building the temple was not in God's uh, plan. I probably would have done the same thing, though. I think about it. If I was in Nathan's shoes, if I was in my office tomorrow morning working on paperwork, I heard the doors uh, open up and I can tell if it's my brother's walk, my dad's walk, or my mom's walk. I can just tell their walk. And if I hear a walk that's not theirs, I usually pop my head out just to see uh, what's going on, right? And uh, usually it's the UPS guy or one of you coming in. And uh, so I pop my head out and it's someone I've never met before. And so I go and meet them. Hey, how you doing? Uh, Drew Rogers, pastor here, Rogers City Baptist Church. How can I help you? And they say, you know what? I was driving by and I noticed that you guys have a lot of cars in the parking lot. Noticed a lot of kids running around out in the parking lot after service. Lots of kids playing basketball and the uh, playgrounds full of kids trying to run from the playground to the parking lot and moms trying to hoard them onto the playground. And I noticed you guys don't have a gym on the property. I'd like to build you guys a gym. And I, you know, uh, disc golf is really becoming a big thing. And I, saw, I know you guys have some property. I'd like to build you guys a disc golf course. I'd like to put some, maybe an 18-hole putt-putt course. It might be really nice for your kids' ministry. I uh, really would like to, I notice your parking lot's kind of uneven and, you know, all over the place here. And I almost tripped walking into church. I'd like to have your parking lot repaid for you. And, and uh, just started listing off all of these things. And he said, uh, would that be okay with you? I don't think my answer would be, you know what, give me a six and let me pray about that. Uh, my, probably my answer would be, oh, when can you start? Uh, you know, snow's going to fly here in a couple months. Let's get the footings poured so we have a gym for uh, the, the, the winter. That's, I would imagine, would have been Nathan's initial reaction, not because he was trying to act out of God's plan, but he's just thinking logically, 
I would imagine this is going to be something that God's okay with. David wants to build the king of the nation, wants to build a house for God. That's got to be something that God would want. Though it was out of a good heart, and it was a good thing, neither David nor Nathan asked God if it was what he wanted. God told Nathan, in fact, in verse 4, that he was mistaken in telling David to build a house for him. And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me a house for me to dwell in? Nathan, God tells Nathan then what he wants David to hear. Just because something's good, so here's a principle that we can apply to our life for today. Just because something's good, or just because it's a good thing, doesn't mean that it's something that we ought to do, or it doesn't mean that it's something that's in God's plan for us. There's a lot of things that are good things that I could do, but I don't believe are in God's plan for me. And we have to make sure, I'm not going to take that thought any further, but you know where you're at. And just because there's a, an opportunity that's there, just because there's a situation that you feel like you can help in or you could add it to your schedule, it doesn't mean that you ought to. Check with God first. Don't just say, yep, let's do that. Because then it gets a little painful when God has to come in and say, hey, I didn't want you to do this in the first place, and I'm going to have to pry that thing out of your life. It's better just to check with the boss first before you uh, swipe uh, the company card, right? God goes on to tell Nathan that he never asked David nor any of his people ever to build him a house. God identifies himself with his people, not with a building. Notice this in verse 6. Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. God was there all along. We know God was with the children of Israel every step of the way, from when they left Egypt up until this point when David's king. But God said, I never asked for a house. I never needed a house because I'm not worried about dwelling in a building. I'm worried about dwelling with my people. It's interesting that we're going to flip to John chapter 1. All right, flip over to John chapter 1. That word that he uses in verse 6, whereas I have not dwelt, we're going to find that again in the book of John, chapter 1, and verse 14. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, John, chapter 1, verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus Christ. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word there, dwelt, means to pitch a tent. Jesus came down and he decided to be brought to this world. Jesus wasn't born on the, on the world. He was, he arrived, right? Jesus, the, the Jesus uh, on Christmas time or when he was in the manger, that wasn't the beginning of Christ. That was just uh, a different uh, form of Jesus. Jesus uh, always has been. Jesus, of course, is God and we're going to get uh, looking at this in a minute. Jesus arrived to earth in the, really the weakest form that he could have. He could have come in any, in any uh, body, any shape, uh, any, any, anything that he wanted to, but he came as a man and he dwelt among us. He, he pitched his tent in the form of man, the weakest form that he could have uh, ever come in because he wasn't worried about being exalted or raised up necessarily. He was worried about dwelling with his people. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. God, again, is going to reiterate, we're back in 2 Samuel chapter 7, that he did not ask, nor had ever asked anyone to build him a temple, but he gave all the credit to David. Verse 7, In all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye not me an house of cedar? And then God goes on to remind David that not only did, had he not asked for a house, but he also reminds David that he's the one who exalted David into the position that he is now. Verse 8, Now therefore so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following the sheep to be a ruler over my people, over Israel. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name, uh, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. If you compare David with any ruler that's ever been in world history, David is going to stack up right there with some of the greatest men that have ever lived. 
Uh, you, you consider the personal uh, abilities that David had, whether it was as a warrior or as a musician or as a writer or as uh, just his wisdom and his strength. David was outstanding in his abilities. He was outstanding in his personal accomplishments. He, uh, how many uh, teenage young men or young adult men can say, yeah, you see that lion over there? I killed one like that with my bare hands. Uh, and speaking of bare hands, uh, I also killed a bear too, the same way. Uh, you, you know, like those, that big, uh, those giant people that live over uh, like in the land of Gath? I killed one of those guys too. Uh, when he was fully armored with his armor bear, I just had a slingshot, and I sunk a stone so far into his head uh, that he fell over, and then I cut his head off with his own sword, and then I carried his head back to our camp, and we killed the rest of them too. Just personal accomplishments and all the other things that David had done up to this point, David could have very easily been filled with pride and said, I've done a lot of things. We know all those things were done in the power of the Lord. His kingdom accomplishments, David's kingdom very quickly becomes... Uh, the strength of, of the area, and he puts all of the other uh, nations uh, down in their place. God delivers the land, and really nation is a, uh, the nation is a stronghold. Uh, Solomon takes that even further, and everything ran through uh, the nation of Israel during the time that David reigned and his children reigned. Uh, the battle victories that he won, the, the ladies from a young, from, as, a, as a young man, what did they sing? Saul hath slain his thousands. But David is ten thousands, and I think that was a little bit of an exaggeration. He had slain ten thousands up to the point that he killed Goliath, but it was just giving ode to the fact that David was a mighty man. He was a, a mighty man of battle and war. He's the author of the Psalms, an incredible man. And here, David, and here God is reminding David, I'm the one that put you in that position. I'm the one who took you from literally being a shepherd, following some sheep, to being one of the greatest men that's ever walked on the face of the earth. God then makes a, a promise to the nation of Israel as a whole. We're going to see verse 10. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies. And then God makes David a promise. End of verse 11. Also, the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. David wanted to do something for God. That's how this whole chapter got started. David was looking out and he said, why am I dwelling in a house of cedar? And the Lord's dwelling in a house of cedar. Of curtains. And he said, I want to do something for God. And we get all the way to here in verse 11, and God says, you wanted to do something for me. You're not qualified to do what you want to do for me. I'm going to have your son do it. But because you wanted to do something for me, I'm going to do something for you. God knew and appreciated the desire of David's heart. God said, David, you want to do something for me, but I'm going to do something for you. God does this often. He does this in my life. He does this in your life. He rewards the desires that we have to do something for him. And in turn, he does things, some things, many things for us. We cannot outdo and we cannot outgive God. Now we're going to see in full that the promise that God makes to David, and it's a promise that much Old Testament prophecy hinges upon, and it's a promise that's important if we're going to understand the Bible Message. What is the message of the Bible? Really, the, all of the Word of God is pointing to the cross, is pointing to Christ, and it's pointing how we have an opportunity to be re reconciled back to God as sinners. That's really the overwhelming message of the Word of God. And if we're going to understand that message, we have to understand the promise that God makes to David here from verse 12 to verse 16. So let's read it. Verse 12, And when, the day, when thy days be fulfilled... And thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, that means to be dead. I will set up this, thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. God's not just referring to Solomon. Of course, Solomon was the next in line. God wasn't just talking about establishing his son next, but he was also talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. I told you we were going to refer to the New Testament a little back, a little bit. Flip over to Romans chapter 1. Here the Apostle Paul is kicking off uh, my favorite book of the Bible, the book of Romans. If I could only have one book of the Bible 
uh, to read for the rest of my life, it would be the book of Romans. It is the declaration of the believer, and it really is kind of like the constitution uh, for Christians. It has everything in there that we need to know. Paul, uh, through inspiration of the Holy uh, Ghost, uh, does a great job in writing, uh, being very concise in a lot of doctrinal principles. But he kicks off this book with a callback to 2 Samuel chapter 7. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. So the Apostle Paul kicks off the book of Romans by reminding us that Jesus Christ is of the seed of David. Verse 13 of 2 Samuel chapter 7, He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Solomon was the next one in line. Solomon was the, going to be the one who built the house for God, the house in his name. But beyond that, that phrase established the throne of his kingdom, that goes beyond Solomon and looks further into the future, promising that one day Jesus Christ would sit on the throne of David. Wow. Luke chapter 1 and verse 30. Flip over there. This is the angel coming down and talking with Mary in uh, what is setting up to be the Christmas story that we would generally read in Luke chapter 2. The angel comes to Mary and says this in Luke chapter 1, verse 30, And the angel said unto her, <clears throat> Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. So in these verses that we've read so far in 2 Samuel chapter 7, we've seen that God promised David that Jesus would be of his lineage. We see that God promises that when Jesus comes to reign, that he is going to sit on David's throne. Let's continue on in verse number 14 of 2 Samuel 7. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. Jesus, in his position in the Trinity, is who? He is the blank of God. He's the Son of God, right? God, Jesus is the Son. God is the Father. In John chapter 20, verse 17, I'll read this for you. Jesus saith unto her, Jesus has risen up from the grave, and he says, Touch me not, for I am not ascended to my Father. But go, in my, go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. How can Jesus' Father be their Father? How can Jesus' Father be my Father? God is Jesus' Father by position. God is my Father through regeneration, through reconciliation. John chapter 1, verse 12, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to do what? To be sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. The right that is given to me for simply believing on the name of Jesus Christ is found in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. But then we find an interesting phrase after that phrase in verse 14 that says, if he commit iniquity, we're talking about Jesus here. So this is interesting when you're reading it in this context. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. Why is God saying, if Jesus sins, I'm going to chasten him? That's just weird, right? Because we know that Jesus is perfect. We know that Jesus can't sin because he's God and God is holiness. <laughs> Jesus did no wrong. So why would God say this? Flip over to actually flip over to Isaiah chapter 53. I'm going to read you a verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 while you're going there. For he hath made him to be sin for us. Who knew no sin? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 3 reads like this, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. 
Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. What did he say in verse 14? If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. That there is a prophecy and also a promise that when Jesus took his sin upon us, that God who cannot look on sin, who has to deal righteously with sin, would deal with his son. But not because his son was iniquity, but because he took our iniquities on him. Though David and the line of David uh, sinned, God would be merciful and fulfill the promise that he just made. You think about what God just promised, that Jesus would come from David, that Jesus would sit on David's throne, that the Savior of the world would be of the seed of David. David, in the next few chapters here, is going to make some of big mistakes, right? We know that he's going to commit adultery with Bathsheba. He's going to commit murder uh, with Bathsheba's wife. He's going to do some other things that are going to cause him some big consequences. David's children, Absalom, Solomon, are going to make some big mistakes. But yet God promises that even though he and the rest of uh, the line of uh, the children of men uh, on are going to make mistakes that God is still going to be faithful, merciful, and fulfill his promise. Look at verse 15. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. God considered this promise important enough that he confirms it over and over and over again. And for the next few minutes, we're going to look at some other confirmations of these promises that he made that, to David, that David would be uh, the, uh, that Jesus Christ would come from the line and seed of David, that David, or that Jesus would sit on David's throne, that the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, would bear our iniquities and be the Savior, and that man would come from the line and seed of David. Psalm 89. Turn to Psalm 89. Verse 34. God's going to confirm this promise again in Scripture and to David. Psalm 89, verse 34. <clears throat> My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Aren't you glad that God doesn't change his promises? There's times where I promise somebody, hey, I will not forget that. I'll make sure I take care of that this week. And guess what? I alter the things that come from my lips. I completely forget or I think, ah, oh, it's not that important. I'll get to it next week. They'll understand. God doesn't do that. When God says, I will, he does. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. This promise was also prophesied by Jeremiah in chapter 23, verse 5 of Jeremiah. Behold, the day shall come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Let's flip over to Acts chapter 2. The Apostle Peter is preaching at Pentecost, and he reminds and confirms the same promise from 2 Samuel chapter 7. Acts chapter 2, verse 29. Men and brethren, let me speak freely, uh, let me freely speak unto you, Peter generally did, anyways, uh, of the patriarch David. That he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God hath sworn with an oath unto him, that the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, he, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses." Peter is reminding the church there and confirming that not only did God make the promise, but now God has fulfilled the promise that he made to David. It's confirmed also by Jesus himself in the book of Revelation, chapter 22. Flip over there. In one of the last verses of the Bible, Jesus confirms 
this promise that was made to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. The last verse we'll look at, and it's a good one. Revelation 22, verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. God, when he makes a promise, goes good on his promise. And this promise that he made to David, he didn't forget it. He didn't go back. He didn't change it. He was faithful to keep that promise. I'm glad that he did because salvation's plan, my opportunity to be redeemed back to Christ, was contingent on the promise that he made to David many, many, many years ago. Verse 17 of 2 Samuel chapter 7 wraps up by saying God was talking to Nathan the prophet and he said, according to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. Aren't you glad that Nathan was faithful not to leave anything out that God told him? Uh, because what God told him was pretty important. That's, a, that's an encouragement to me and to you when God speaks to you and, and God lays on your heart, hey, you need to share this word with somebody. Don't leave anything out. Don't say, ah, it doesn't matter. I'm just a whatever it is. I don't need to share what I've learned in my Bible. Well, if Nathan would have had that attitude, we would have missed a whole, a whole lot uh, from the Word of God. Where did all this start? Where did this whole chapter begin? It began with David thinking about God and David wanting to do something for God. Where are you at today? Are you, do you think about God on a daily basis? Or do you only think about him when you come to church? Or, you know, if things really work out and it was a perfect week and you're not too tired, you're not too sick, you're not too whatever, and you come to church, then you think about God? Or do you think about him every day? Do you think about what he's done for you? Because it was in thinking about God and what God had done for David that David said, you know what, I need to, there's, there's something that I can help. There's something I can do for God. And in the desire that David didn't even do for God because God said, hold your horses there. You are a bloody man. You're not going to be building my temple. David didn't even get to do what he wanted to do for God. But just because David had the heart and desire and was willing to do something for God, God said, David, you want to do something for me. I'm going to do something for you. And we can have that same blessing. We can have that same opportunity. Whether what it is that God wants us to do, he reveals that to us personally, very plainly, and says, Drew, this is what you're going to do today. He did that to me already this morning. He said, you need to do this. And I said, yes, sir. I have learned by now. I just, yes, sir. Uh, or maybe it's something where he hasn't asked you, but he's given you the liberty to just say, hey, I see a need here. As long as it's okay with him and I pray about it and it's not out of his will, I'm going to just going to go ahead and jump in and donate my time, donate my resources, donate my money to this. In doing that, then God's going to say, hey, I appreciate that. I see what you did there. I'm going to go ahead and do something for you now. And that's the thought that can, that, that can practically be applied to our lives today. The bigger thought for the knowledge sake, for prophecy, wow. God made a promise to David that is extremely important. He said, Jesus Christ, my only son, the one who's going to be able to reconcile and redeem the world back to me, if they believe on him, he's going to come from your seed. He is going to sit on your throne, and he is going to be crucified, chastised with the stripes of men for you. What a great promise.